feedback I've gotten over the years from attendees is that while the material is powerful and it impacts their businesses, they just don't get enough. So they say to me, if only we could spend more time with you and the other presenters and really pick your brain, absorb the knowledge that you have to share and get hands-on training. So to satisfy this need, I created Success GPS programs. If you're here, it's because you want to succeed. Being the fact that it's a hands-on workshop, we are getting a ton of value in terms of gaining more clarity for our business and approach, uh, approaching ways to wow the clients and customers that we do have. Some of the Success GPS events are short, single-day experiences, a couple of hours, but our premier event is an extended, hands-on, experiential retreat. Business owners can come, spend three full days locked down and learning everything they need to know to be successful in business and in life. Everybody up, I'll come out and get you. You over there too, up, up, up. See, if you already sit down, then you've already flunked, which means you've already given up. Industry leaders that are here today that are so authentic and passionate about being of service to others, uh, it, it sort of opens my heart and my mind to being really possible and staying on the right track. I've spent 25 years listening to thousands of speakers looking for the best of the best. Of all these, I handpicked this lineup of amazing speakers because I knew that they would bring it and that they would put it all on the line with their heart and soul to create an amazing experience for our attendees. In addition, all of the presenters are passionate about helping small businesses and entrepreneurs succeed and take the time on and off the stage for every attendee to get what they need to go to that next level. So, so I say show up, follow up, and lift up. Give back and don't ever, I don't care where you are in life, if you think you haven't arrived somewhere to where you can't give something back, you're wrong. It's the exact opposite. The minute you start stepping, bring someone with you. Don't even hesitate, get here, do it. Be here, be the first one signed up, be, sit in the front row, get all the information and you, it will be mind-blowing. It'll just be, it's a game changer to be here. It's just a game changer. Wow. So don't miss the experience live and in person. Go to register at successgpsseminars.com for our upcoming event. And in the meantime, get ready to be inspired. I'm not gonna talk too much about myself. I'll integrate a little bit. Um, we've done the motivational thing and, and what I really want you guys to to get out of this is the execution part. So I'm gonna talk a lot about money, time, passion, how to align those different things. Um, but specifically, I'm gonna be talking to you guys about the lifestyle leveraging concept. And this is something that we use not only to build assets, but do it in a methodical way that gives you more lifestyle dollars so you can enjoy what you've been working hard to do. Um, but so I kind of know where to go. How many of you are business owners? <laughs> Pretty much everybody. Um, how many people would like to improve their finances? Okay. So we got the right room. Okay. <laughs> um, so the next 30 minutes, these are the three things I'm going to show you. Um, how to align time, money, and passion. How to build two assets with the same dollar. And how to finance your business and personal expenses using OPM, other people's money. Uh, my promise to you is that I'm going to give you a proven strategy that can potentially save you thousands in long term if you follow it, depending on what season of life you're in and how long we're going to live here. Um, maybe even tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. Oh. Okay. Um, it is very customized to you specifically, but um, this is something that we I've been spending a lot of my personal time with. Um, Tom over here uh, works with me in Colorado, and I mean, it's been kind of nonstop. So we do full plans for individuals and companies, but this is something very fundamental that no matter where you are with your personal finances or your business can potentially give you a lot more leverage to use. Um, I'm going to get to what kind of things I can offer you here in a second, but we put this lifestyle leveraging concept under a full platform that we're still building. Um, we call this the retirement myth. And so where Jen and I have really connected is it talks about how to align time, money, and passion. 
because some of my background, of course, it's financial, but it's also social science and personal development. And so it's really understanding how institutions are teaching us about money, about time, and how we're supposed to defer these things. Because that's what gives them the benefit. They're leveraging us. And so what I'd like to help you guys do is completely flip the script as much as we can. Okay, so literally it's, it can be a complete reversal of how you're already doing things. And some of these things we almost take for granted. Um, proof of concepts is something that we're still working on for both the retirement myth and a lifestyle secret. So with that being said, um, just to be very blunt with you guys, that creates a very good opportunity for you. Um, I've kind of taken a personal approach to this to say to a lot of influencers that want to help spread this message, right? They want to help spread the message to improve people's situations. And I've had it, had some calls where I just said, you know what, I can't do exactly what you want to do yet. Um, because of the documentation part of it. We can't just let everything outside of the box because we got to have a proof of concept. So with that being said, uh, I've told Jen and some of you that I personally will spend some time out here in Reno, um, in Tahoe, being from Colorado. Uh, so over July and August, we're going to allow 40 businesses to get personal consultation time on this particular subject so this is really what i'm going to be offering you so it's not going to mean anything right this second um but we'll give you two two-hour consultations basically just finding money you didn't know you had so that could be money going to the irs that could be going to paying bills um and turning it in your favor so by the time you're really saving money which i'll show you how that's going to be done we estimated it's about a ten thousand dollar value and again, we're doing that because we want to be able to document everything and we want to see you succeed. We want you guys to be our stories that we get to share to more and more people. Um, so we've changed this a little bit. That's where you can go schedule at the end, but because of some other people that have been here today, uh, we're going to make this a lot easier. If you want to text 21777, um, it's going to be fact is going to be the key word. What that'll bring you to is a uh, schedule once calendar where you can schedule your own time. So we'll be here July and August. If you'd like to do something like that, just real quickly, Jen said that I've done a book with her and, and Jack Canfield among some other authors, obviously founder of the retirement myth with, with what I just described to you. I think the biggest thing people know me for is a systems guy. And I, and I got to say, <laughs> Here's the disclaimer, I'm not a gazillionaire and I don't have any magic Kool-Aid for you. But what I have been blessed to do is I've had a number of friends and colleagues and mentors that have put me in good positions over time to where I've got to do a lot of things that I've, I've liked to do in the past. So I, I love traveling the world. Um, some of my friends and I, we do a couple trips a year where we'll go to different countries and we'll bring in experts you know, similar to something like this. And we'll really learn from each other, but we'll also get that experience of giving back. So we'll go to um, like Guatemala, for instance, where you know they don't have water for the school and, and we'll help provide water. Um, we will do some adventurous kinds of things, you know, so things you haven't done before and that's particular to that culture. Just what we love to do. So my goal is to help as many of you do the same. And the fun part is you, you continually build friendships and this is really about a long-term vision so from a standpoint of even our business what we're really trying to define and do even more with this documentation is we will get paid through helping you. so we don't just give you know like free consultations and there's not money coming what happens is you guys being business owners a lot of you if you have a business we're your employees that's how you're treating us if you have personal finances that that's all you're concerned about you don't run a business you're going to run your finances like a business and we're still going to be your employees. So in other words, you are in the driver's seat to where we must improve your situation or we don't get paid. At least that's how it's positioned right now. And I think that works very well for you guys because that puts us in a collaborative 
environment. Um, and it also puts you guys in the driver's seat to really think, uh, change your thinking a little bit. So what ends up happening is when I describe this concept, it's one of several concepts that I think might alter little nuances into the way you think, and you'll have a number of questions. So I'm going to breeze through something that's fairly complicated, but I think we've dummy, not dummied it down, but made it very simple to at least grasp the basic concepts. And if you do have questions at the end, um, we can go through it, but that's really where the consultation is for. So there's going to be a lot of slides. If you have questions, I just make sure you, you write them down because there's no way to answer them all today. Um, but the first thing is, what are your challenges? So these are just questions to kind of mentally give a yes or no to is most of money you or your business is making going right back to bills or taxes. You don't have to raise your hand, just yes or no. Does purchasing power seem limited? So the ability to buy things when you see opportunities or to invest because of limitations of getting enough credit or having cash on hand. Do money and time conflict with each other? Does reinvesting in your business or finances improving your lifestyle conflicting as well? Do you feel like you deserve more money for the efforts than what you put in? Okay. You know, these are structured in a way where we've dealt with a number of people to know you're going to answer yes, of course. Um, but that's not the real problem. These are symptoms of the root of the problem. And so the retirement myth is really designed in a way to make us, myself included, be more of, of pawns to larger, com larger companies and Uncle Sam. Okay? And it's not to say we don't get benefits from products and laws and so forth, but we have to work a lot harder knowing that we're kind of second to who's designing the game to begin with. Um, I've heard this several times, so I'm just going to put it up there. I don't think the exact amount of time needs to be relevant, but you, as you read this, it has been said that if all the wealth in the world is distributed equally, within 10 years, approximately 3% would control all the wealth. I wonder why that is. So the answer, for the most part, in my opinion, is banking. Okay, it's the functioning of money. In fact, this concept I'm about to show you in and of itself, if you take two successful families that would have been billionaires in the time when they created the wealth, the Vanderbilts and the Rothschilds, it's been said that most of the Vanderbilts, unfortunately, are not millionaires. Whereas the Rothschilds are all not only millionaires, but a lot of them are in the beast, billionaires. So what's the difference? The difference is the Rothschilds are a big part of the banking and understand how that works. So they even create within their family different rules of functioning to ensure that they have, they're going to be successful. It's just a functioning of how money works. So here's what happens. The banks really is something we take for granted where we put our money and we fall into one of two categories. So we could be very diligent and save money but as soon as we put money into the bank, what the bank is turning around to do is really making the profit. They're the ones saying, okay, here's some free dollars that we're going to go invest because if you take all of us collectively and we're putting all our money in the bank, we're not all going to take it out at the same time. So they're going to make money on that volume, investing it themselves. And then when we take money out, basic expenses, a lot of times that's simply interest that the banks are making. On the debtor side, things like credit. Credit were des was designed for the banking institutions to know what their risk is to create cash flow for themselves. Okay, so they're dependent not only on getting money from us, but they need to make sure that we're not going to default on loans. So what they're doing is they're creating an asset out of nowhere to basically go back to themselves, and that pays for operations and any um, dividends and... Um, and stocks that people may have in the company. Um, excuse that little headline there, but it, um, investments are no different. So this is overly simplified 
what I see happening in the stock market, which has kind of been the main focus of investments the last 80 years. If you have someone that has a hundred thousand dollars after tax, or just a hundred thousand dollars, if in year one they gained fifty percent, that's simple math. That's one hundred fifty thousand dollars. Okay, but what happens in year two? A lot of people would say if your money went down fifty percent, you'd be at a hundred thousand dollars. It's, it's something that, you know, we just kind of take for granted. You guys know this, but no, it's $75,000. And what that illustrates is you can't have this volatility. Just, if you lose that money, not only do you have to recoup it, but it stops what Einstein calls the eighth wonder of the world, which is compound interest. Okay, so if you can keep that money growing, that's the most ideal situation you want to have. The problem is, you also have things you need to buy. So how do you buy things and grow your money at the same time? That's the question. So without getting into this slide so much, lifestyle capital is really what we're after. So it's the ability to grow your money, compound interest, eighth wonder of the world, nonstop, guaranteed, but take your money out simultaneously and methodically. Okay, It doesn't mean you're just going to take it all out. But if you see that blue shaded area, what that should mean is you're in a mode of constant improvement. Okay, and so the more you're using this concept that I'm going to show you, and you're collaborating on it, you're really putting yourself in a situation where you can mitigate a lot of the risks that you're having day to day and be in a lot more control over your time and your finances. <laughs> I'm, I'm laughing because I just found this very, very interesting. It was an IRS report that actually came out in 2015 based on average gross income from the year of 2012. Um, if you see at the top there where it says the top 0.001%, what that is showing is that that's a 0.001% top gross income earners. And to be in that category you had to make a minimum of $62 million. The average was $161 million. But look at the share of taxes there. What their obligation is, 17.6. So if you kind of trickle down there to 0 0.01, 0 0.1, 1, 5, 10, the 10%, to be in the top 10%, you had to make $125,000. But if you look at the tax rate, it's 19.21. So what you're probably asking yourself is how in the world is the top 0.001% paying less taxes than the rest of the top 10%? That's what I'm about to show you. <laughs> or maybe not. You guys don't look excited. <laughs> um, the answer into what they're really doing lies within financing. And when I say financing, this is something that when I ask people what financing is, generally they're thinking it's a debt that you must repay, which is correct, but it's not the whole story. You finance literally everything in your business and personal budgets. It's just a matter of what are you losing out on and how do you do things. So no matter what, that should be one and two. <laughs> um, if you're paying in cash, what you lose is the ability for that money to keep growing as soon as you spend it. Okay, well, what else would you do? Well, you get a loan or a credit card, debt instrument. Well, what happens there is now you're paying other people more money than is necessary. So what is the alternative then? <laughs> it's using other people's money. Okay, so... How the next question is, how, how do we do that? What are ways that are effective to use other people's money? I'm going to get to that here in just a second, but I think since most of you are business owners, I'm going to walk you through an employee as well. It's, it's understanding the game that you're in. So we're all likely in different seasons of business or in a different life cycle. But gen generally, if you're a startup company, you're going to have one or two problems. One is, as you make money, you're going to be reinvesting right back into the company. That's dollars you no longer have. 
If you're not doing that, then you might be delaying the growth of your company. It's one of the two problems. If you're growing your company, then there's a bad guy waiting to get into your pocket. <laughs> That's usually Uncle Sam, but that could also mean you have now more friends and family members that are coming to you and asking for money. Um, maturity. The problem there a lot of times is it, there may be assets, but the company's kind of plateaued. So it's just they've lost their ability to innovate or create strategies that generate more dollars. And then if you're in the decline, of course, you just have to find a new strategy. Otherwise, you may not have a business. So what I'm going to do is take one particular industry. Um, so this could apply to anything. But being in Colorado, we deal a lot with um, you know, farmers and so forth. So I just happen to use farmers as today's story. Um, so you have Eric, the employee, Sarah, the saver, Brad, the borrower, Peter, we're going to call that paper wealth, and then Laura, lifestyle wealth. So the challenge is being an employee, as I'm sure a lot of you are aware, is you automatically have a general income ceiling as to what you can make. Okay, you might get bonused at the end of the year, quarterly or so forth, whatever that structure may be, but a lot of times the majority of your paycheck is already predetermined. Okay, and then the next problem that you're going to have is once you have a paycheck, it's not all yours, right? The first person that gets paid is Uncle Sam. Okay, so that leaves you with what you get to take home. Well, if you see that pie chart there to the right, in a general sense, this is about what you're going to find for an average American. 35% um, is going to go to debt, 18% transportation, 42% goes to bills, and you have 5% savings. If I break down two of those pieces, savings and debt, here's what just doesn't make sense, but what's happening for a lot of people. If you have Eric making $100,000 after tax, 5%, $5,000. But the debt he's paying is $35,000. The rate of return that you would need to get on $5,000 to offset that $35,000 is 700% for one year. Okay, so where you can get a 700% rate of return, pretty tough to do. So it's just the functioning of where, where is your money? Sarah the saver, her problem is going to be that, okay, I'm ready to start my business. I need to go get seeds. I need to get chemicals. So I'm going to have crops and I'm going to be able to protect them and go out and sell them. Great. Well, as soon as she does that, she goes back down to essentially nothing in terms of dollars. And she's going to want to say, how can I save more time to have an optimal crop share? So I'm going to go buy a tractor. So she buys a tractor, goes back down to zero. Next thing maintenance down to zero next thing repairs down to zero and then you're wondering well what was all that work for if I'm constantly back down to zero I'm constantly working in my business for that next thing and then there's something surprised surprising or not but your bottom line is essentially going through the cycle Brad is the same story but in reverse so he's starting off with some debt obligation of some kind. Whatever those terms may be, he's automatically obliged to turn a portion of his paycheck right back over to the creditor that he owes. Okay, so he works to pay it off. He's really working for the creditor, right? Pays it off, he goes down to the next thing that he wants to buy once he's at zero, same cycle. Okay? Now, if you look at this, for some reason, sorry for these slides are showing up weird, but the liabilities, the liabilities is zero. So that says none. And then you have land at a million dollars, real estate a million, machines 500K, supplies 200K. On paper, this doesn't look like there's an issue, right? I mean, the guy's debt free. Pretty sweet. I would agree that the next question, though, is okay, what if. I mean, Peter's done something right to get to that position. But he's likely a mature business at this stage because where's the cash? 
There's no liquidity. So if he needed liquidity, yes, there's ways around it, but in general terms, most of the time, there's one of two things that's going to happen. One, he's going to have to put something down as collateral and get a loan, or he's going to have to sell something. And if he's got to sell something quickly, likely he's not going to sell it for what it's deemed to be worth. Okay, so Laura with lifestyle wealth is really what we're after. So there's all these benefits that you can see, but the main thing is, again, you have this constant compound growth, but you're able to take money out as needed. That's what we're after. But besides that, you want to take money out tax-free. You want, you want it to be tax-deferred. You want that guaranteed rate of return. Use other people's money. Cut, cut costs on expenses. Grow two assets with the same dollar. And have liquidity, which means use and control. So I'm going to show you how to do all that. Now, of course, we use a number of different strategies. So we incorporate CPAs, investment advisors, um, attorneys, and so forth within what we do. But this particular concept actually utilizes, believe it or not, life insurance. Okay? Life insurance, what the heck does that have to do with other people's money? Well, it's a contract. Life insurance is a contract that you own. And there's different types of insurance, there's different ways that they function. So you really have to understand all these little nuances and know what kind of insurance to use. But essentially what happens is there's a cash component that works like a bank account. Okay, but that bank account accrues interest. So let's just say that there's $100,000. You're paying a premium. Now, as a caveat, it, it is life insurance. So when you pay this premium, you are going to pay for life insurance, the death benefit, if you will. But if you design them correctly, most of the money will go towards cash value. In fact, in the late 70s and early 80s, when people could be relatively successful with any kind of investment, really, what they were trying to do then is once they're successful, say, where can I shelter my money that I don't need, where it can grow, and then there's a tax-free component. Well, that works pretty well because Uncle Sam got pretty upset and the loss changed. <laughs> Um, so what ended up happening is large companies, Uncle Sam, went head to head. And then eventually they came to a conclusion that, okay, we're going to be forced to pay X amount of dollars for cost of insurance and still get the function of the cash value. And what would happen is that cost of insurance is now something that the insurance company profits on and then they get taxed instead. So that's just kind of the story there. But we want to get in the functioning of, okay, well, how do you use this as lifestyle capital? So you have 100K in an account, and then what happens is this money grows generally with a dividend-paying component, okay? We tend to like to use um, policies that give you the most optimal control and usage of the dollars that you put in. So what I mean by that is there's going to be a loanable component so let's just say you needed $20,000. Well, if you need $20,000, what's going to happen is that money's going to come out tax-free as a loan from the insurance company. What's going to be happening on the cash value side is you're going to have a guarantee of some kind of growth. You know, a good number right now is approximately 4%. And you're probably not looking at much more than 6% by the time you get dividends paid to you. But I don't want us to focus on the interest rate. I just want you to know that's what's happening. So that twenty that hundred thousand dollars is growing somewhere between approximately four to six percent. But you're taking out a loan for twenty thousand dollars of which you can pay back or not pay back because you are the bank in this scenario. Now I'd have a recommendation that you do pay it back and I'll get to that in a second. But what you just did there is if you were to use your own cash, if you spent $20,000 out of your $100,000, you would have had $80,000. But keep in mind that $100,000 is still growing. 
Okay. Um, what you're going to do with that twenty thousand dollars is you're going to create an amortization table. Um, we're missing a column there on the right, I think, based on the size there, but I'll, I'll walk you through what we're missing. So the $100,000 is going to be growing at, let's just call it 5%, that 4 to 6%. So if it's at 5%, year two, you're going to have $105,000. Year three, it's going up. Okay, it's already systematized. We're creating an amortization table for 10 years. Okay, and what I put in there is 7%. Okay, so let's just assume it's a little higher, it's 7%. Well, what, you'll, um, what you should be seeing on that right side that got cut off there <laughs> is that every single year you're getting a larger spread of dollars that are available to use. Okay, so your cash value should be growing like this and the loans that you're taking on your policy should be going down. Because you're disciplined, you created your own amortization table. Can I get at least a nod if we're, we're following? Okay, <laughs> cool. Okay, so what most of us know is, and I get this question all the time, is, Troy, what do you believe about buy term and invest the rest? Because it was a strategy that was used for a number of years. Um, I honestly don't really have an opinion on it because we look at everybody's situation uniquely, and it's, it's honestly not a cookie cutter approach in our opinion. Um, but what happens a lot of times from an insurance standpoint is they're, they're just profiting off of free dollars like the bank is. Okay, so why, we're here, why we heard about that a lot between the 80s and really up to almost 2008 is because we're just pooling all our money into policies. So if we had a 20 year policy, and we're going to get a death benefit because we're trying to take care of a spouse or kids. In that 20 years, if we don't die, what's our benefit? And life insurance is based on your health and age. So let's just assume Eric's 45 and he turns 65 years old. The insurance company is going to ask him, well, would you like to have insurance again? And charge him a substantial higher premium. Well, if you didn't get something in 20 years, what's the chances of you doing something like that? Less than 2% of these policies pay out. So essentially, if we were all funneling our money into term policies, what the insurance company is doing is making huge profit, and they're just paying us on their interest. But here's one thing that happened in 2008 that actually helped us. Insurance, well, banks, you could see a number of them failed. Insurance companies a lot of times have larger asset bases, but even still they prove they could fail. So even though there was bailouts and so forth, and that's a whole different conversation, insurance companies had to be a lot more innovative to the 99% of us that are out there. And so what they started to do is market concepts that have been used for a number of years from people or what I'm showing you. It's been around since Benjamin Franklin, Walt Disney's used it. A number of people have used it, but there's only certain demographics where it's generally taught. Okay, and Coming from the industry, I'll just tell you, a lot of what is taught is just a conditioning from what the institutions want to capture dollars to invest. Okay, So in 2008, they started marketing what we're calling the lifestyle leveraging concept to the rest of America. They also incorporated things that didn't exist before, or at least not to the extent of all three of these things. So with people losing a lot of money by not getting any benefit other than 20 years, they started to say, okay, well, if you have a situation where you're terminally, terminally ill or in a long-term care situation, you can, you can actually leverage the death benefit while you're alive. So if you got sick, for example, and say insurance, your health insurance is covering 80% of your bills, but you have a $100,000 health bill. Well, if you have a death benefit of $500,000, for example, they will pay you at a discount of that $500,000. So 
maybe you qualify between 30 and 80 percent so they give you three hundred thousand dollars well why would they do that well number one as we put in dollars into the company they're still reinvesting but if they have or if they deem that you're going to be a higher risk to pass away what they're just saying we won't pay you a hundred percent we'll let you take the three hundred thousand and cut our losses and you can do with whatever you want with it while you're alive okay and also there is a death benefit so this next slide that i'm going to show you after this is going to be a little bit morbid but whatever you have in a policy let's just say your cash value is a hundred thousand dollars your death benefit is guaranteed to be higher than that hundred thousand dollars okay so where that comes into play is for your business it comes into play for your family a lot of times you see people pass away and there's no money well you can literally create a higher estate out of thin air so let's just say Laura is 38 years old or you know a female 38 and this is dragging on to age 72 well this is based on putting in seventy two thousand dollars a year okay so um, you don't have to get too caught up in the numbers, but what's happening is that there's a cost of insurance and then there's the rate of return you're getting. So the cash surrender value shows how the cash is growing through the years and then it shows how the death benefit grows with it. So if someone were to pass away early on in the policy, the arbitrage between the money you put in and the death benefit would be, in this case, 3,102%. Okay, now that's going to decline through the years because of your likelihood to die, but even dragging it out 35 years in this case is a little over 250%. And that all goes tax free to any beneficiary that you would stipulate within the contract. Now, what's cool is not only can you use this for business, but you can use it a lot for your full family. Okay, so. I don't want to be overly simplistic, but if you use like the Rothschilds as an example, um, they really get their whole family involved in planning. So they will actually have annual meetings and so forth with different family members. And you'll create different strategies to sustain dollars between your family members. So if you can create money knowing that there's going to be a death benefit, then that goes to the next generation. Well, that next generation is not going to be Eric, where you're having to get a 700% rate of return to offset interest because you already have the cash. If you need the money while you're alive, there's a cash value component that's working and growing more and more each single year. So you're getting a lot of leverage no matter how you're using the policy. Now, there is going to be challenges that you want to create if you use this concept. So, the more and more people are able to save money, <laughs> what's cool is you can actually start to expense things right away and cut out your budget. Okay, so I'm going to use a phone bill as an example. Let's just say your phone bill is 300 bucks, $3,600 a year. A lot of times, if you negotiate with a vendor and say, I'm going to pay for a whole year up front as opposed to monthly, they may give you a discount. So let's just say the phone bill company says, okay, we'll give you a contract where you pay $3,000 up front. Well, if you pay that $3,000 up front, not only are you saving $600 you would have otherwise spent, but you would actually be using the, the insurance company's money to pay for your phone for the whole year and now that $3,600 you were planning on spending you're putting right back into a policy that has guaranteed growth already built into it. The key is the discipline and understanding of the concept because if you're only using X percent um, 
then you're guaranteed to have that lifestyle capital that goes like this. We're getting a wider spread of money that you can use. <clears throat> I don't expect you to completely follow me on this because this is kind of getting into 102, 103. Um, but Nevada is a great example of a state where you can transfer more money personally into a policy. And if you ever get sued with your business, um, the cash value of an insurance policy is protected. Actually, one, double check this with an attorney in Nevada, but my understanding is it's actually 100%. Um, where I'm from in Colorado, it's only $50,000, okay? Now here's what's cool about it, is you can leverage between your business and personal. You could actually transfer a million dollars in income, you know, whatever, regardless of the time period, over to yourself personally, take a loan from your policy, just call it four and three quarters percent, loan your business, a little bit above that four and three quarters percent. So now you're gaining one and a quarter percent, or excuse me, yeah, 1.25 percent extra. And then you have cash value that's guaranteed to grow personally, but then you also buy a tractor. Okay, so that tractor might generate more dollars for your business. So you got leverage going back and forth. So almost done here, so these are the three things I promised. So basically by creating lifestyle dollars, that's what allows you to align time, money, and passion. Um, by using other people's money, that's where you can build two assets, so the personal and business assets simultaneously. Um, and then you can start to expense things out of your budget to hopefully go from a phone bill to working in most of the things that you wanna do. Like go on vacation, add in a car payment or a down payment on a home, those kinds of things. Um, so what you need to win, um, you, you have your cards in front of you, but you pay yourself first and recruit money going to taxes, bills, and loss in the form of opportunity cost. Keep your money growing and use other people's money instead. Act like a bank. Build a system for lifestyle capital. Leverage the same dollar to create new assets. Optimize tax-free strategies. Keep uninterrupted compound interest working in your favor. Expense budget items and operational costs using other people's money. Shelter assets, some states are better than others. And create a legacy, whether that's your business or family. So you have a choice. Um, I don't expect you to grasp all this, but in terms of where we can help is, I've said we can set two two-hour meetings set aside. If there's anything that you want to talk about, whether it's your personal finances or business, it's really starting with your objectives. Um, this concept happens to be a functioning component pretty much everybody can use. Um, but we'll just start with talking through your business, walking you through your personal finances and determine, well, what are the different options that you have to improve your situation? Okay, so the biggest thing I want you guys to take away, regardless of the concept that I shared with you, is that you should not feel like you're in this influenced environment where you have to wait till an arbitrary age to do the things that you want to do, an arbitrary time in your business. Yes, there is that effort that we got to put in, but the more willing we are to take a step back and look at, okay, well, just what's the basic functioning of money? and you learn what there is to know today, I don't expect you to understand every single thing I shared with you. But that's where with questions, you're gonna have that aha moment that clicks. And once you have that aha moment, you're gonna ask new questions and new questions. 80% of what we do has literally nothing to do with money. It has to do with the way you think and collaborate with us because our job description should be you want this, here's the options. Troy, this isn't the way I do things. This, this thing I don't completely understand, so I don't put my money or my time into things I don't understand. This, not only is it the way I do things, I understand it, and oh, I have that aha moment of doing something better and getting that constant improvement. That's all, and uh, 
looking forward to sharing. And thank you all that, that spoke today as well. <clears throat>